Yeah, thanks, you, Judy. So, as you mentioned, um, let me just get into my. So, Carly's not here, but I'm happy to present on behalf and talk to you about an exciting collaboration that uh, my lab has had with uh, folks at Coleman Agriculture, where we're looking at some regional differences of some popular American hop varieties that are grown throughout the Willamette Valley. The concept here is we're looking at does growing location matter within the Walnut Valley? And if it does, does it bear itself out in terms of hop chemistry? Uh, does it bear itself out in terms of beer that has been brewed with those hops? And can we make some uh, initial stabs as to what might drive those differences? Working with Coleman Ag is great because they've got farms that span all reaches of the Walnut Valley. And in this study, we looked at five different locations, 10 different fields, and uh, within those three different hop varieties. And you'll see that the designation here are the varieties the location and then the field number. Working with Andy Gallagher, the hop soil scientist uh, and, the, and the folks at Coleman Ag, uh, we would go to the, the individual fields and we'd look for sites within the field that gave us some representation of the diversity of the soil composition in that field. Andy would drill five foot soil cores and typically we do five of those on a site. So you can see in this location here, we've got five in red. We've got uh, two different major soil classes uh, within this particular site. The type of statistical analysis we're doing this is basically using a multiple factor analysis whereby we take the different sets of data, for instance, the soil characterization and parent uh, material data from Andy along with the management data. Uh, this is principally uh, fertilization and sprays as well as weather and climate data and begin to map those together and then add to that the, the chemistry data as a supplementary material. And from the, the MFAs, we get these biplots that give us a sense of similarities and differences. And what you can see on here is we've got three main groupings up here in the right-hand corner are hops that are being grown in the Mount Angel area. That's what MA is. Down here in the right, uh, lower right quadrant are the Graspin, uh, Williams, and uh, Antdoor sites. And then over here on the left-hand side are principally the alluvial sites, but also uh, the Goulet site. And so this is some evidence that we're seeing um, spatial variation or regional uh, differences. And to re refresh yourself, these differences are basically located here, Mount Angel, the Aunt Dora Williams Grassman site, uh, and then as well as the alluvial plus the Goulet site. Seeing those differences play out in the MFA, we took composite samples of those hops, created single hop IPAs out of them, presented those to, to um, panelists to see whether they could discriminate differences within a variety between fields, they could. And then we provide, we moved forward and did uh, descriptive analysis on this using a check all that apply approach. And we can see that panelists can discriminate differences within variety based on field. For instance, if you look in green at the strata samples, the alluvial site 50 and the Goulet were judged as being similar, but the alluvial site 49, which sits right next to the Lamp River, while the 50 sits about a mile westward, were viewed as being different. And these similar patterns existed for both Simcoe and Mosaic. Carly is monitoring the, the website, um, so she's happy to answer your questions or reach out to anybody on the research team. We'd be happy to answer your questions. Thanks. Thanks, Tom, for stepping in for Carly. Okay, next we're going to hear from Charlie Rauer, who is with the University of Minnesota. Charlie, are you ready to shake it away? I think so. Can you hear me and um, see my screen? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, there's your screen. Fantastic. So my name's Charlie Rohr. I am a uh, vegetable researcher at the University of Minnesota, and hop research is a very, it's a, fairly small part of my job as a vegetable researcher, but I've been breeding hops since 2012. Um, and my program is similar to other hop breeding programs, uh, except it's much smaller. But like other breeding programs, I need to evaluate agronomic and brewing quality of the hops that I'm breeding. And I'm not gonna talk about agronomics today. Um, to ev evaluate brewing quality, there are different methods. And the first, so I'm just gonna show you around my poster here on the on the um, tool. Uh, the most easy way, the fastest, cheapest way to evaluate hop character is to do a rub. And uh, I use rub in the field to determine which plants will not be suitable for brewing, which ones uh, are worth throwing away. Um, but to determine which hops are the best, they have to be used in beer, really. And so I need a really fast 
method that is cheaper than making beer because I don't have a brewery um, and I don't have uh, technical staff to uh, make beer for me. Um, so a very helpful and useful, useful resource near me is the RAR Technical Center. And Patty Arone is the manager of research and innovation there. And she suggested that to get hop character in beer, I use Randalls. And Randalls are under sink filters um, that are stuffed with hops instead of filters developed by Sam Calione at Dogfish Head. And what I've done is I took five of them and I filled them each with a different hop, put them in a cooler and surrounded them with ice. And then you push beer through them and the beer takes on the character of whatever hop is in the filter. And so here's the manifold that's used, um, five different filters. And here's one um, tap that is not filtered through hops uh, as a control. And the beer we used was Miller High Life because it doesn't have a lot of natural hop character in it. Uh, that was suggested by a patty. And so then we can serve six different beers to tasters and make comparisons between the five hopped beers and the one unhopped beer. And just to give you a brief indication of um, what we look for, one of the things we did was just a, a nine point hedonic scale. Do you like it? How much um, do you like it? Here are the hops we did with a cascade on a, our hedonic scales are in here. But one of the thing I, one of the things I wanted to do, we had 12 attributes that we asked them to rate. Um, these were all rated by volunteers at RAR. And I don't really like spider plots because if there are two lines on a spider plot, you can't necessarily tell what the difference is between the two lines. So I came up with a method to, um, to allow us to compare the control beer here in this orangey yellow line to uh, the hopped beer. So this is hop B in this case. And these are the 12 attributes we measured. And we can find um, that if this orange line does not overlap with these lines, then there probably is this character was added by that hop. So this hop added citrus, floral, and herbal and intense characters. And um, yeah. And our conclusions are very brief. So um, you're welcome to look around at my poster and see what you can find. Thanks. Thank you, Charlie. We appreciate that. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to be coming back to the West Coast now. Uh, from Yakima Chief Hops, we have Jacqueline Height. And Jacqueline, are you ready to present? I am. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Perfect. Going. Okay. So my poster. Um, so, like she said, my name is Jacqueline Height. I am a research technician at Yakima Chief Hops in um, Yakima, Washington. Um, I'm going to be talking today about some mosaic aromatic compound monitoring that we did during harvest in 2019. Um, so basically what we did is we worked with Yakima Chief ranches for this and we selected three rows within a mosaic field and uh, picked fresh hops from those three rows and combined them together and then ran um, analysis on our GCMS and then our GCQTOF with our sulfur chemiluminescence detector. Um, we used the twister stir bars with the headspace um, and we picked samples starting about one month prior to the estimated harvest date and then um, about one week post harvest. Um, we followed track 13 terpene compounds, 13 esters, two terpene alcohols, one leaf alcohol, and then eight sulfur containing compounds. Um, and then within it, we basically found a general trend that the terpenes, esters, um, terpene alcohols, and sulfur containing compounds all had a general increasing trend um, until September 11th, and then had a slight dip um, in concentration and we presume that to either be potentially a lab sampling error or a um, response to a chemical alarm or plant signaling, um, depending on where that field was located within all the fields itself. Um, there could have been like a plant signaling thing and those plants could have gone into a state where they reverted back to producing primary metabolites versus secondary. And we can see that reduction in compounds there. Um, the sulfur-containing compounds kind of followed a general trend. They didn't show as much of a dip, 
as the other compounds, but um, they had, again, the increasing trend and kind of held steady. Um, the one compound that we did track was the leaf alcohol or cis-3-hexanol, um, which had an opposite trend. It had a very large concentration at the beginning of um, picking, and then as the um, cones developed and ripened, it decreased over time. Um, so overall, we kind of use that as a potential indicative of ripeness within the hot plant. Um, so we are um, going to continue this study. This is only based off of three rows in one field um, for one year. So we hope to investigate this subject matter um, further. And I would just like to acknowledge um, Yakima Chief Francis for allowing us to um, do this project with them. Hey, thank you, Jacqueline. And just a, uh, just a reminder to the people in the audience, if you want to have uh, some questions answered now, you can put them in the Q&A session and the authors will be monitoring that and they can answer for you. And now we are going to have a presentation by a couple of New Belgium Brewing Company employees. And that is Justin Alexander and Stacy Williams. Uh, Justin and Stacy, are you ready? Hi, Judy. Thanks. Hi, Justin. Uh, let me get my screen shared here for you. Does that work? Not yet. Uh oh. There we go. Is that better? Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. Uh, there hi, you everyone. go. Perfect. Uh, my name is Justin Alexander. Uh, my coworker Stacy Williams and I did this uh, method of validation of determining volatile phenols, the so smoke taint in hops. Um, <clears throat> so this is just an overview of our poster. So it's going to cover the the method development to analyze the volatile phenols that contribute to smoke taint in hops. Uh, and for those that are unaware, there were uh, numerous wildfires on the west coast in the U.S. this year. So a portion of that smoke managed to make its way into the growing region for some of these hops. Um, <clears throat> smoke taint in hops is relatively unexplored. Uh, so that's why we're working on this method development. But in the wine industry, it's been researched quite a bit more. So with that being said, uh, the wine industry uses a few volatile phenols, guaiacol, 4 uh, MO, and p cresol as their markers to determine the extent of smoke taint. So uh, we, we decided to roll with those volatile phenols as our specific markers for our method. Um, but that being said, we haven't explored any other compounds yet. So uh, we, we developed this method on an Agilent GCMS with a, a two-phase beamy fiber, aero fiber. And our raw hops came to us from John Haas, Inc. Um, so thank you to them. And the, uh, the two hop lots, one was our control lot, which wasn't exposed to smoke taint, and the other was exposed to smoke. So, uh, and they were both grown in similar regions. And uh, the difference between the two is that the control was harvested before the smoke rolled into the valley and the smoke tainted sample was harvested uh, after the smoke rolled in and was also kilned during. So uh, lots of exposure to the second one. Uh, there were citra hops for anybody curious. Um, so specific to these volatile phenols, we did see really good separation for each, uh, aside from ocresol, which ended up co-eluting with uh, beta caryophylline oxide. And we chose our calibration amounts based on uh, flavor thresholds in wine. So with, uh, with method development, development and validation finished up, we, we looked into extract efficiency, which showed uh, a linear increase based on an increase in addition rate. So we did 300, 500, 1,000, and 1,500 grams per hectoliter addition rates. And this was just done in a 5% ethanol, so essentially just a hop tea. Uh, and we saw really good extract efficiency. Um, and so based on that extract efficiency, we moved to a beer matrix with uh, two different addition points 
uh, for the control and for the smoke tainted hop samples. Uh, a cold aerated wort addition, so just after knockout, right when yeast was pitched, and a post fermentation dry hop addition. And what we saw at both addition points was that the volatile phenols extract readily into the spear matrix. Um, and most interesting is we, we did have a sensory analysis, perf analysis performed on each. And even though each of these volatile phenols was below flavor threshold in wine, uh, these, these compounds are said to have additive properties, which can lower the overall aroma threshold. So we did see smoke taint in, in each uh, addition point for the uh, smoke tainted hop sample. Um, <clears throat> so we landed on, uh, after method development and doing the, the beer research, we landed that guayacol is a really good marker to determine the extent of smoke taint uh, for future crops that might be exposed to smoke, given that the volatile phenols do readily extract into a beer matrix at a lower uh, percent ethanol. Our beer matrix was roughly six. Um, and ideally, sensory research will come in in the future and kind of determine what our actual aroma thresholds are for beer and uh, which additive properties of these compounds are, um, how low the aroma threshold would be if they're all present. So uh, our contact info is inside of our, our stack as well. So feel free to reach out with questions should you have any. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Justin. Well, smoke taint was a popular topic this year. And so we have another poster regarding smoke taint. And this is from a Yakima Chief Hops employee, Thomas Yancon. Thomas, are you ready? Yes, I am. Hi, everyone. Let me show Hi, Thomas. Here. All right. Um, hi, I am Tommy Ancone. I'm the R&D data analyst at Yakima Chief Hops. Um, our poster is about examining the impact of sustained wildfire smoke on hop and beer quality. Um, this project was kind of thrust upon us this year. We weren't planning on doing it, but um, with the extreme wildfires, we really had to take it up and it was affecting a lot of our um, lots, so we had to look at it. Um, during harvest, we put every intake lot through our sensory panel. Each sample is usually analyzed by four to seven people. As we got further along into September, we were starting to see more and more heavily affected lots um, in terms of smoke effect. Um, we classified these heav heavily affected lots as having 29% or more smoky response based on um, check all that apply uh, sensory. Um, we also had a lot of lots that one or two people identified as smoky, but um, we kind of segregated out the extreme ones from the common. Um, overall, 15.7% of our lots were identified as smoky by at least one panelist, and the most heavily affected varieties were mosaic and citra. Um, we started our research by looking at the air quality data, um, which we got from the air quality monitoring, monitoring stations around the valley um, and in Oregon. Um, our poster has these plots up here in those uh, green bars, um, but if you take a closer look, you can really see that um, the, this year's smoke was much worse than at least the previous three or four years, um, and it was very sustained. Um, as a heads up, as the um, data for air quality was pretty limited, we used um, one monitoring station in Sunnyside and one in Salem as our Washington and Oregon um, air quality data sources. So not perfect, but it's really um, all we had to go on this year. Um, from there, we did some sensory or some analysis on the smoky lots and compared them to historical brewing values. Um, there were a few significant differences from previous years, but the smoky lots were not outside the normal specs um, for those varieties. So we didn't feel confident tying that to smoke effects um, more than we could to just annual variation. Uh, from there, we looked at sensory data um, and there was a very clear um, effect caused by the smoky hops. These smoky lots had a statistically significantly less uh, berry, tropical, citrus, uh, sweet aromatic, and floral aroma intensity than the non-smoky lots, and obviously higher smoke ratings as well. 
Um, we found that there was a significant relationship between the air quality index rating on the day harvest began and the bat lot smoky rating. Um, so now that we know, we knew that uh, smoke affected the hops, we learned to look at what the smoky hops would do in beer. Um, so our, our sensory research coordinator, Tessa, and Jeremy, our brewer, put together an experimental design to test how smoky hops behave in the whirlpool and as a dry hop. Um, this trial utilized two smoky lots, one of which was very highly rated for smoke, and the other one was um, not as highly rated, but it was detected as smoky. Uh, we found that smoke did not transmit through whirlpool hopping, but the smokier of the two lots we tested uh, by dry hopping did produce a um, detectably smoky beer from our uh, beer sensory panel. Uh, taking those steps a step further, or taking those results a step further, uh, we tested different concentrations of the highly smoky hop lot as a dry hop uh, by blending it at different ratios with a control non-smoky lot. Uh, even at low concentrations, the smoky lot, um, there was a very, uh, it was detectable in beer. So I think we went down to 5% smoke was detected by some panelists. So. As the smoke concentration increased, uh, the fruity and citrus flavors also were significantly reduced compared to the control batch. So not only did we see the smoky increase, um, it was kind of dragging down some of those positive uh, aromas that we would expect. Um, and our last step in this project so far has been to produce beer um, with extract made from a smoky hot lot. Um, and in that experiment, none of our 11 beer panelists uh, detected smoky flavor in the control or the beer made with the smoky hop extract. Um, so we've learned quite a bit from the study, but there's still a lot to investigate. Um, and we hope to plan some more trials in the future um, in years that are very smoky, but hopefully those don't happen, don't happen for a long time. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you, Thomas. And yes, let's, I live in Salem, so I know about the smokes. I hope you don't have any trials any in any <laughs> year soon. <laughs> yeah, that would be nice. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so our next presenter uh, is a member of Tom Shell Hammer's program at Oregon State University, Arn Stockholm. Arn, are you ready? I sure am. Let me just get the uh, screen share pulled up and then we'll be ready to go. All right. Um, so thanks everyone for, for being here. Thanks for having me. Um, so the poster that I'm presenting here is um, an offshoot of a regional identity um, project that we did in collaboration with Coleman Agriculture. Um, so we were looking at the, uh, the effects of farm management, soil, and weather variables on hop diastatic power. Um, so the study design of this regional identity project, um, looking at um, hop quality and things like that, um, allowed us to look at three varieties um, across four different locations. Um, and you see we have several fields um, and several sites within uh, each of those fields. So we were looking at hops within the Willamette Valley. Um, so we have fields from Independence up to St. Paul in the major hop growing region um, of, of Oregon. Um, so we were able to take the, um, the hops and we analyzed them for sugar production um, in basically sugar production over uh, the levels of sugar seen in a base non dry hopped beer. Um, we see here, we have the three varieties, the various fields within the varieties, um, and each of these data points represents an average of two technical replications per site. Um, so you can see there were uh, pretty distinct differences between the varieties. Um, Simcoe, on average, uh, has higher enzymatic power than mosaic or strata. Strata and mosaic on average have similar um, enzymatic power, but you can see there's far greater variability within mosaic. Um, and if you look at within fields, strata has less variability within fields, whereas mosaic um, has this really wide variability. So we took this 
and we looked at um, various agronomic variables. Um, we looked at soil variables. We looked at weather variables um, in terms of growing degree days. We looked at fertilizer applications and we looked at uh, pesticide applications. Some conclusions uh, that we came to are um, that there, it's a very complex system. Um, there are many potential drivers of um, hop, of differences in hop diastatic power. Um, and one interesting um, potential driver could be uh, fungus. Um, uh, we saw more days of fungicide treatment being associated with lower enzymatic power. And so there could be some effect either of um, uh, mildews on hop enzymatic power or of the fungicide application on the enzymatic power. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I've got. Let's see if there are any. Okay, thank right. you, Art. Yeah, thanks. Next up, uh, we're going to Minnesota now, the University of Minnesota in St. Paul, and Joshua Havel is going to be presenting his poster. Joshua? <clears throat> Hi, thanks Judith for the introduction and thanks to everyone for being here. Let's go ahead and share my screen here. We all set? Yep. All right, so I'm gonna discuss with you very briefly a collaborative project we have uh, with Dr. John Henning um, at the USDA Corvallis. Uh, so as you've heard uh, several times this morning, um, powdery mildew is a major constraint to hot production um, and is definitely growing uh, as a major constraint in production in the Eastern US um, in nascent production regions. So um, John developed a segregating population between a resistant female cultivar, the cultivar Zeta, uh, and a susceptible male breeding line, 21058M, um, and we took it upon ourselves to germinate growth seedlings, um, assess them for their segregation of the powdery mildew resistant phenotype. Um, we saw a, a little bit of transgressive segregation. That is, we had some individuals that were more susceptible actually than the um, susceptible male parent, which is interesting, um, in that there might be some minor effect QTL um, or uh, minor effect uh, genetic loci controlling um, quantitative resistance in that male. Um, we then, um, in addition to the parents, um, sequenced, uh, skim sequenced all of the progeny, and we worked on building a genetic map. And you can think of it as like a, a mile marker or each marker is like a mile marker along a roadway or a highway system. Um, and we did this to try and um, build a map for each one of the chromosomes so that we could try and assess marker trait associations between the powdery, mil powdery mildew resistant phenotype and where we would locate that in the, on which chromosomes and where on that chromosome we would find um, genes or you know, a cluster of genes, a region of the genome that would be associated with that resistance. Um, similar to what John presented earlier. Um, interestingly, um, in, in the background of this cross, we actually know that the female parent is segregating for multiple R genes and R genes tend to lie in clusters um, as John mentioned previously. Um, and so in performing these marker trait associations, um, we saw chromosome four light up as um, an area where um, there were associations between resistance and um, the, the markers of interest. And we further investigated that um, looking at the allele contribution um, between the resistant and susceptible types. Um, and we're in the process right now of um, doing some wet lab based validation, developing cast markers, um, which John mentioned earlier is a good um, fingerprinting technique. Um, so the idea being that these CASP markers would be a relatively quick and simple way to select individuals that you know um, possess resistance without ever having to actually go through the process of um, maintaining pathogen isolates, characterizing those pathogen isolates, and then subsequently having to inoculate all of the plants that you might be growing out in the greenhouse. So much more rapid way of being able to assess individuals um, in the future for breeding purposes, and then also making sure that you're only investing those resources 
on individuals that possess that characteristic of interest. Um, hopefully making the process of breeding and, and possibly integrating traits like powdery mildew resistance, or you know, maybe in the future, things like downy or alpha, et cetera, um, much more high throughput. Um, and if there are any questions that anybody has, feel free to pass them along in the chat. Uh, otherwise, uh, my contact information is on the uh, Stack website. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua. Appreciate it. And we're going to be coming back to the West Coast now. Uh, we have a researcher with the USDA ARS Forage Seed and Cereal Research Unit in Corvallis. And this is Renee Erickson. Renee, are you ready? I am. Can you see me? Not yet. Not yet. How's there that? Yep. All right. And I will share screen. Are you seeing that? Yes, we are. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so I am Renee Erickson. I am a postdoctoral researcher with John Henning in the Hop Genetics Program at the USDA ARS. And this poster is on some work uh, that is currently in review with the journal Scientific Reports uh, with co-authors Zillian Paget cobb Sean Townsend, and John Henning where you find that the genes uh, involved for alpha acid biosynthesis are turned way down in lupulin glands in the hop leaves exposed to heat and drought. So what, is, what does that mean, turned down? Well, um, every cell in your body has a copy of every gene that your body needs, but what differentiates different tissues in the body, say for example, your liver versus your hair, are the genes that are or turned on, but it's not an, an on off type of light switch. It's, it's more like a, a dimmer switch. The genes can be turned on a little, they can be turned on a lot, or they can be turned way up. Um, and how high they're turned up reflects their activity and importance. Um, hops and, and plants are, are similar in that way. Um, so that uh, lupulin glands, rather take a step back, lupulin glands are uh, modified trichomes um, that hold the secondary metabolites um, that provide the flavor in beer. And they are most important in the cones, but they do also exist in leaves and stems as well. So um, the genes within these lupulin glands produce these secondary metabolites and they are turned on or off, um, way up or way down based on their importance at the time. Um, so how do we know this? How do we know that genes for alpha acid biosynthesis are turned down under heat and drought? Well, we grew Cascade under four different treatments and what we call a split-split plot design. So we had two different growth chambers, uh, plants, some plants grown under a control temperature at about 75 degrees Fahrenheit and another growth, growth chamber set at a high temperature of about 102 degrees Fahrenheit. And within these growth chambers, uh, some of the plants were given all the water they wanted and some of the plants were allowed to dry out a little bit. Uh, and then we took leaf samples and sequency express genes. We were not able to get cone samples because some of the plants from this compound treatment of drought and high temperature didn't grow big enough to produce cones. We did get cones out of some of these other treatments, but not out of this one treatment. And what we found was that uh, this particular gene, valerophenone synthase or VPS, um, which performs a really critical role in alpha acid and beta acid production is turned way down under these stress treatments. So here in this graph, we have the four treatments uh, along this x-axis, the control, high temperature, low water or drought, and a compound treatment of both. Um, and along the y-axis, we have this measure of gene expression and normalized read counts. And what we see is there's a significant decrease in gene expression under these controlled, under these stress treatments. Um, so what does that mean? What does that mean for you as growers and brewers? Um, there's been a number of previous studies that have looked at the effect of heat and drought on um, hop 
cone yield and alpha acid content. And this is an example of one of those. This is Mosnanol from 2019 out of the Czech Republic. They looked at cultivar SOTS and found that um, where precipitation increased, so did yield. There was a positive uh, relationship between uh, precipitation and cone yield. But they also found that as temperatures inc increased, alpha acid content decreased here. And this is an example, of, only an example of one, one study. There are a number of studies that found very similar results. And what our work here suggests is that VPS is the reason why. VPS, this filariphenone synthase, or its regulatory proteins, um, the proteins that turn the gene on and off appear to be really stress sensitive for some reason. Um, we also found reductions in expression of genes involved in uh, the hop oil production, such as um, myrcene, karyophyllene, and humulene synthesis. So what does this mean, again, for you? Uh, by mid-century, 20, 30 years from now, uh, climate models predict that uh, warmer winter, winter temperatures will lead to summer water shortages, and there'll be an increase in the number of heat waves uh, in the Washington area. Uh, so alpha acid content could seriously decline. It could be difficult to maintain consistent alpha acid concentrations and possibly for some of these oils as well. Um, and we at the Hop Breeding and Genetics Program for USDA are looking for variation among cultivars to breed more resilient varieties so that we can maintain consistency of some of these secondary metabolites in cones. And I will ha be happy to take questions. Um, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Renee. Appreciate your time. Okay, so again, if you wanna put any questions in the Q&A uh, area of your screen or to go directly to Renee's poster where you can chat your questions there too. Well, we're not going very far for the next presentation because we have one of Dave Gent's graduate students, uh, Cameron Ross is going to be presenting his poster. Hi, Cameron. Hey, thanks for that intro, Judy. So hopefully you can all see that and hear me fine. So um, I'm gonna be talking about hot powdery mildew, uh, regional, regional disease spread, and then late season disease management. And I kind of put everything in a quick PowerPoint here so uh, um, you all can see it a little bit clearer than a small poster there. Um, so kind of two objectives were conveyed here in this uh, poster that I have up online for you guys to look at. Um, the first one is understand east-west east patterns of pathogen overwintering and development over time in the Willamette Valley. So looking at hot powdery mildew and kind of uh, where that is uh, located. And then a second part of um, what's on that poster is understanding the importance and efficacy of uh, late season fungicide applications and then their role in uh, disease control. So the first one, how we went about this is we um, conducted a sample across Willamette Valley of um, Nugget. So we did a complete census of that, as well as looking at um, some key locations um, across the Willamette Valley. And so uh, one of the reasons we wanted to do this is we had historically seen um, disease of hot powdery mildew. Uh, it was more focused on the Eastern side of the Willamette Valley. And um, so I can kind of show you what that looks like here. And all the dots here that we, uh, all the white dots here are yards that we sampled. And as they change from white to pink, uh, that's where we detected powdery mildew. And so this is April of 2017, the first month of our sampling. Uh, and then in July 2017, uh, you can see there was a lot more powdery mildew. So this is three months later, um, the last month of our sampling. Um, you can look at this eastern side and you see that there's a lot more uh, powdery mildew disease than you might see on the western extent of this. And then so when we went to look at 2019 here. We expanded our, our search to go a little bit more south, a little bit more north, and a little bit more west here uh, to see where powdery mildew was uh, throughout the Willamette Valley. And 
um, as we move into July, you'll see there is a large increase of disease here and it's kind of in all corners. Um, and even though that there is more disease over uh, towards the eastern side, you're gonna find that uh, not every yard is gonna be escaping uh, disease here. So if you're over in the western side where you may have not had hot powdery mildew for uh, a few years, that doesn't mean you're not at risk for having uh, hot powdery mildew uh, disease enter your yard. And then I can show you what all four months that we sampled, which would be April, May, June, and July, look like based on uh, longitude here. And so this is the proportion of plants with powdery mildew, and each dot here represents an individual uh, yard that we sampled. And we sampled 200 plants in April and May, and then four, or 400 plants in April and May, and then 200 plants in June and July. Um, and what you see is uh, kind of that same pattern, uh, just a little bit different visualization here, where the yards over on the eastern side, we tend to find more disease, but it's still uh, prevalent over on the western side. And then kind of to just keep things rolling here, I'll move into that second objective. So the second one, understanding the importance and efficacy of late season fungicide applications and their role in disease control. We wanted to look at this because we understand that uh, there's ontogenic resistance. In other words, uh, the younger the hot powdery mildew cones get infected, uh, the worse the disease is going to affect them um, in terms of quality factors. And so we wanted to understand how important are sprays in the, the later season. So this is uh, July 31st and onwards. And so how we looked at this was we, in Nugget, again, um, we conducted a late season fungicide trial. And so you'll see four dates at this table up on top, uh, July 31st, August 10th, and August 19th, and then lastly, September 1st. And so that was the date of uh, the last spray for um, a given block. And this was done in a randomized block design. Um, so all four treatments here would receive uh, Quintec as um, a spray on July 31st. And then one of those treatments in that randomized block design on August 10th is not going to be sprayed with Quintec, whereas the other three are going to be sprayed with Flint Extra. Um, and then similarly, similarly on August 19th, um, two of those blocks, the one that didn't get sprayed on August 10th, and then another one, or <clears throat> two of those treatments, uh, the one that didn't get sprayed on August 10th, and then another one are not going to be sprayed with Vivando where the other two are, and then uh, similarly on September 1st. And what we found um, was that during the, even though we had different dates of the last sprays here, uh, we did not find a significant difference between um, each treatment and the last date of that last spray. And so there was relatively similar disease levels and uh, yeah, no significant difference there um, in the amount of disease that we detected when we were sampling cones. Um, and then furthermore, there wasn't a difference in uh, mean, uh, median cone color or alpha acids that we found. So um, with that, I'd just like to say thank you. And um, if you have any questions that come to mind afterwards, feel free to email me here. And then thanks to HRC, all the growers and um, help that you guys have given me over the past few years. So thanks. Okay, thank you, Cameron. So next we're going to head east to Michigan State University. And we have Aaron Staples. Aaron, are you ready? Ready, Judy. Thank you for the introduction. Um, thank you for your time having me today. Um, so yeah, I'll be presenting a study called Untapping Terroir. Um, it's a collaboration between Michigan State University, Cambium Analytica, 
Silver Spruce Brewing Company and Founders Brewing Company. So on the project is me, Trey Malone, Rob Sarine, Scott Stirr, Alex Adams, and Alec Mull. Um, and before I dive into our overall methodology and results, I just want to point out a few things on the on the stack website. Uh, we have a working draft of the paper up here. So this paper is in review currently, but we're happy to field questions, comments, suggestions um, from you. And at the bottom of the stack, uh, we also have the contact information for each of the authors. So please feel free to reach out if you have any comments or questions. Um, so the objective of this study was threefold. First, we wanted to determine whether the same hop cultivar grown in different eco regions would have uh, different chemical compositions. So to figure this out, we attained four hop samples of Chinook cultivar from two from Michigan and two from the Pacific Northwest. And we had Alex Adams of Cambium Analytica conduct a terpenes analysis and an unknowns analysis. So I just wanna go quickly over the terpenes analysis. Uh, so we have our four hop samples, like I said, two from Michigan, two from the Pacific Northwest. Um, and of the 10 terpenes detected in our hop samples, we found several differences amongst them. Most notably is the presence of alpha pinene or the lack of presence of alpha pinene, uh, which is commonly associated with the pine aromas. It was not detected in either of our Michigan hop samples. So no alpha pinene in either of our Michigan hops. The second objective was to determine whether beer industry professionals could taste the difference of between beers that were brewed using these hops. So we had Scott Stir of Silver Spruce Brewing Company um, brew a baseline beer and we separated this beer into smaller vats and we dry hopped each of these vats with one of the four hop samples. Uh, if you want a full list of the procedures for the brewing, uh, it's under this brewing beer and isolating terroir tile. Um, but we conducted a blind test at the Great Lakes Hop and Barley Conference. And there were some statistically significant differences detected amongst the beers. So beer A and beer B used the Michigan hops while beer C and D used the Pacific Northwest hops. Overall, beer B was seen as more tropical than the other beers and beer A was perceived as more bitter um, than the other beers. So not only did, were there some chemical composition differences, but they were also detected amongst the beer drinkers. The last objective was to determine whether brewers were willing to pay a premium for local hops. And to do this, we surveyed mainly uh, Midwest craft brewers, but also some East Coast craft brewers and asked them to engage in a series of hypothetical hop purchasing decisions. So we asked them to choose between uh, a pound of hops that was grown in their state in the Pacific Northwest or in the Great Lakes. Uh, and these varied in price, but the brewers were asked to uh, just kind of think that these were the same cultivar besides the price and um, where they were grown. They, they have the same quality, the same consistency, all the same analytics you're just deciding between the place of origin and the price. And this allows us to uh, measure the trade-off between uh, place of origin and price without explicitly asking the brewers to state their willingness to pay. And what we find here is that our brewers are willing to pay up to 35% more for state grown hops, holding all else constant. So being of the same cultivar type, um, and what could be driving this? Well, the first is just the idea that this is a hypothetical experiment and we're asking brewers to perceive that everything else about the hops are the same. Um, but what else could it be is first that brewers just have a preference for supporting local growers. Alternatively, there could be a perception that local hops taste different from non-local hops. So a terroir component. And we do have some survey data to back that up here. Um, but for the sake of time, the last is uh, an expectation that beer drinkers are willing to pay a premium for beers produced with uh, local hops. So we asked um, the brewers in the survey when they partook in the choice experiment to determine the premium for local hops. We asked them, do you believe your consumers are willing to pay a premium for beer brewed with local hops in the following locations? The majority of brewers said yes, about 60% uh, for a pint and closer to 
70% for a six pack. Um, so with that, I'll wrap up. Uh, feel free to reach out. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. So for our next presentation, we're going to come back to Oregon. Uh, and we have another one of Dave Gent's students. You heard from her earlier today. So Michelle Wiseman, are you ready? Yes, I am. I, I probably will be a little bit... Um, this is going to be pretty quick because this is all very preliminary data, but I wanted to, it's very important information, so I wanted to get it out to you, even though it's pretty preliminary data. So um, this poster is on the uh, preliminary data for the diversity of hemp powdery mildew in the Pacific Northwest and, of course, the implications for hop growers. Um, today, I mean, this is kind of broadly speaking in the Pacific Northwest. The findings that I'm presenting here are just in Oregon, but I'm also presenting um, a mini proposal that we submitted um, for future sampling in the Pacific Northwest. So just a quick introduction, as all you know, uh, hemp, the hemp grow, growing of hemp is increasing in the Pacific Northwest, um, in particular in Oregon. Uh, last year, there were um, 25,000 um, and acres of hemp registered in Oregon and 3,000, almost 4,000 in Washington, respectively. Um, so this is a slight decrease from 2019, but it's still holding pretty steady uh, around 30 to 40,000 acres within the Pacific Northwest region. Um, there's a small amount of acreage in uh, one county in Idaho, but Idaho hasn't quite legalized the growing of hemp yet. So it's just a, some research going on there. Anyway, with any introduction of new type of cropping systems, there's also um, there's concerns about new pathogen pathogens and pests, and especially with uh, with crops that are in the same family. So hops are within the Cannabaceae. So there's concern about crossover between two closely related plants um, as far as pests and pathogens go. So we we just kind of wanted to report our findings for early findings of different powdery mildews on hemp. <laughs> Uh, sorry. This is the problem with working from home. Um, okay, so first I'm going to talk about uh, Podosphera macularis. This is the one that's probably most concerning. Um, we just discovered this, I shouldn't say we, um, Dr. Cindy Oakham and her talented student um, Taylor Bates found this here in Corvallis, um, well, just outside of Corvallis and on the hemp fields in town. So um, yeah, this is the same mildew that we see on hop that we've been talking about all day long, and it causes pretty severe disease on hemp. Um, we discovered it in, during the flowering time, so um, we're kind of on the lookout on it in the future years, but we don't have a lot of information on it yet. This is just kind of the information of like um, the nitty gritty of how we identified it, the signs and symptoms. It looks pretty much similar to what we see on hop, so powdery lesions. Um, and for hemp growers, it's most concerning on the flowers, um, also for hop growers too. Um, and then most importantly, we've only discovered uh, MAT1 mating type for on hemp thus far. And then the, we did some preliminary characterization of the um, virulence types. Um, and it, what we found was it's a non b 6 pathogen um, race, uh, but that's all very preliminary data. We don't know, if, you know, we haven't done, big surveys. The other um, mildew present on hemp is Golovinomyces ambrosiae, and this is just honestly not a huge concern for hop growers because preliminary data from in-lab um, inoculations indicates that it's a pretty weak pathogen on uh, hop. So, but you know, you can find out some more information here. Um, the major differences when like looking at them in the field. So the one on the left here is the Golovinomyces, or Golovinomyces, and then this one's Podosphera. And what you can see is it's um, Podosphera is much, uh, it's it's much, much more bright white, and uh, the colonies are more dense. Whereas uh, with Golovinomyces, it's more diffuse. And if you have a microscope, it's the differences are even more apparent. So the Golovinomyces canidia, that's just a fancy word for the asexual spores, are more brick shaped, and they lack these. Um, it's they're called fibrosin, fibrosin bodies, essentially like kind of lipid content in the middle, whereas like a uh, photosphera, like they have these little fibrosin bodies and they're more what you describe as like ellipsoidal shaped. So you're looking for, you know, when, when you're 
trying to determine whether you should be concerned about mildew on your hemp. Um, I think you'd be more likely to be concerned about dense white colonies and then um, spores that are more ellipsoidal with fibrosin bodies. So uh, implications, uh, we're mostly concerned about the Yakima region and then the Willamette Valley because there's a lot of overlap uh, with the hemp and hop acreage. So the implications are, especially with Podosphera macularis, there could be some alternate hosts um, going on. So hemp could be, you could be finding Podosphera macularis on hemp and it could move to your hop plants. So that's kind of the biggest concern. And then if that's the case, there's also a concern about um, uh, the movement of plants to and from the Pacific Northwest. Um, because if we're importing hemp plants uh, with Podosphera macularis, we could be importing the MAT2 mating type and that could be a huge problem. We could have sexual reproduction in powdery mildew. So th these are things that we're gonna be looking for um, when we do our future studies. So we have some uh, future research plan. Essentially it's hi hierarchical sampling um, over three different seasons, um, about 20 different sites. We're gonna be looking at that, just the hemp fields. And we're gonna be looking for powdery mildew. And what we'll be doing with that is characterizing that using AMP-seq um, to look at the mating type, race determination, population grouping. And then from there, we'll reassess our management recommendations and provide uh, quarantined recommendations. Um, I think that's about it. You can check out the rest of this um, for all the references and this was accepted as a, a first report and it's pending publication. So that's it. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you, Michelle. Well, now we're gonna go to an area that uh, most of us don't have right now, someplace that's in the 70s. So we're going to the University of Florida and we have Shinsuke Agahara, who's going to talk about hops in Florida. Shinsuke, are you ready? Yeah, I'm just getting ready. Just give me a second, please. Oh, okay, sure thing. Can, can you see the screen now? Yes. Okay, well, thank you so much for the introduction and uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to, to share my research findings today with you. My name is Shinsuke Agihara. I'm a plant physiologist at University of Florida. Uh, I mainly work on uh, different uh, vegetable and small fruit crop like a strawberry, but since 2016, I've been studying how to grow hops in the subtropics. And my research center is located in West Central Florida, about 20 miles southeast of Tampa. The latitude is about 28 degrees north. So as you know, we don't have a sufficient day length to promote good vegetative growth before flower induction. So we use LED supplemental lighting to extend day length so we can control the timing of flowering. So that combined with subtropical climate, uh, we found that we can grow hops uh, twice a year. The spring season in Florida uh, is from February to June and the fall season starts right after that, starting from June and ends in November. So the, the main objective uh, in this study was to optimize the trellis system for double season hop production under subtropical climatic conditions. We tested three different heights, 12 feet, 15 and 18 feet. For straight trellis, this is the single wire trellis and the B trellis. The data I'm presenting today are for the first year cascade planted on February 18th last year. We planted two tissue culture seedlings per hill, uh, three foot plant spacing and 15 foot row spacing, uh, 10 hills per plot and a split plot design with four replication. And this is the picture uh, we took before harvest. Uh, the picture on the left uh, is from the spring season and picture on the right is from the fall season. And we found that the uh, uh, trellis height uh, had an uh, impact on uh, vine distribution and also corn distribution. We found more uniform vine distribution and also corn distribution uh, with a taller trellis. And this is the yield data. Uh, we found that the B trellis is more productive than straight trellis, 23% uh, higher yield in the spring. 
uh, we found the, the same uh, yield increase in the fall, but the difference was statistically significant only in the spring season. Increasing trade is high from 12 to 18 feet, increased the yield by 78% in the spring season and by 49% in the fall season. You can see uh, in the fall, the yield was overall about 50% of the spring season. And this is the trend that we've been seeing in the last couple of years. The spring season yield is always higher than the fall. And uh, this is something that we are trying to work on. Uh, uh, we think that uh, we haven't quite optimized the crop management in the fall season yet. So I, we think that uh, there is room for improvement in the fall season. And uh, the highest yield was for the 18 foot B trellis. When we combined the spring and fall season yield, it was about 1,600 pounds uh, per acre. And this is the, uh, the data of biomass partitioning uh, in dips, stems, and cones uh, in the spring season data on the left and fall season data on the right. What I'd like to point out in this table is that we found increased biomass allocation to cones with a total trellis. So you can see in the spring season, for example, 21% of biomass was partitioned in the cones, but only 12% biomass was partitioned in cones uh, at uh, lower trellis. And we found the opposite trend uh, for the biomass partitioning in dips, uh, total the trellis, uh, less biomass partitioning uh, in dips, and that's in the both seasons. Corn quality data. Uh, we found that the corn quality was minimally affected by trellis design and trellis height. In the spring season, uh, alpha acid was about 6% on average, and uh, in the fall, it was about 5.4%. And I'm going to skip this slide because I think I covered most of that already. And uh, 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 on the website, I put uh, the links to the publication and also uh, our Facebook page and the YouTube channels. And I'd like to thank all the sponsors. Uh, most of our work was funded by a uh, specialty crop block grant uh, from FTAX, uh, Florida Department of Agriculture and the Consumer Services. And we also uh, have many sponsors, uh, uh, mainly local breweries, but also uh, ag industry, uh, gave us some uh, material to start the project and the donation. And uh, finally, I'd like to thank my team and all the people who are working on the HAP project. So strange enough that we have now a big team uh, working on HAPs uh, mm -hmm. at our research center. Plus, we started a breeding program. Uh, we have a plant pathologist, uh, entomologist, nematologist working on this project. We are also looking at the economics uh, of the crop in Florida. And uh, uh, a lot of team members uh, from my lab working on the hops. Uh, uh, Mariel is my student working on hops. So I'd like to thank all of them because uh, it was a lot of work and it's just impossible to get this done without uh, all the support. So thank you so much. Thank you, Shinsuke. Uh, the, our last two presentations, our last two posters are coming from the um, USDA ARS National Clonal Germplasm Repository, and that's in Corvallis, Oregon. And the first one is going to be Mandy Driscoll. Mandy, are you ready? Yeah, yeah. Can you see? Can you see my screen? Let me know. Can you see? Yeah. Can you there see you it go. now? Yes, okay, we can. Great. Okay, great. All right, let me put this. Okay, thank you again for the uh, introduction. My name is Mandy Driscoll and I'm with the USDA ARS National Clonal Germplasm Repository in Corvallis, Oregon. And I wanted to talk to you about one of our projects which was to develop two DNA-based fingerprint sets for hops. The goal of this project was to develop an SSR and a SNP-based fingerprinting set that is able to distinguish European and wild North American material and can be used by growers and breeders alike. So in this slide here, we're gonna be going over ease of use and ease of scoring between the two different methods. So on the left-hand side here, 
you can see that we developed a nine SSR uh, fingerprinting set that is able to be ran in a single multiplex PCR reaction. So for each one of the SSRs, you can see that we have nice clear amplification across the nine SSRs. So this really contributes to ease of scoring and consistency between labs. On the right hand side here, we have our SNP based method. So in this method, we designed 25 cast assays from 25 SNPs. So in the figure here is the output from LGC, their software um, for one SNP. So you can see that each dot represents an individual. And what you try to do is then place that individual into one of the three uh, clusters here. So this really lends to ease of scoring and automation for all the SNPs. The next thing that we did was use the nine SSR fingerprint set to genotype 529 diverse samples. And this was to look at population structure. So um, we did this with two different clustering, uh, clustering analysis. So the main takeaway from this is that the, uh, the clustering analysis separated the cultivated from the wild North American material. And this is good, this is, uh, this is uh, good. We wanted to see this distingu distinguishability so cultivated consisted of European and European hybrids. The next thing that we did was compare our nine SSR fingerprint set to our 25 cast fingerprint set and 190 samples. So the takeaway from this slide is that the nine SSR fingerprint set was able to distinguish wild North American material and cultivated material, but the 25 cast fingerprint set was not able to distinguish wild North American material. Both fingerprint sets were not able to distinguish clones, but this is as expected because Minger, many fingerprint sets do not. The next thing that we did is we use the nine SSR fingerprint set to do parentage analysis and to confirm accession identity, so trueness to type. So say you have a field that's contaminated and you don't know which uh, individual is the correct individual. In this case, we're looking at Tamadori on the bottom. We have two different Tamadoris and we don't know which Tamadori is the correct individual. So what we did is compared the allele calls across all nine SSRs. So the female parents alleles are in orange, the male parent, the male parent alleles are in gray. So you can see that the bottom Tamadori has at least one allele in common with the male and female parent across all nine, SS, nine SSRs, but the top Tamadori does not indicated by the blank and the red allele calls. So this nine SSR um, helped us to determine what, uh, what Tamadori was true to type. The next thing that we did was look at the HIAGA7 uh, SSR, and this SSR has been previously um, associated with sex and biparental populations. So you can see here that we identified potentially two male specific alleles in, in gray, and then in orange, uh, nine female specific alleles. So this potentially has um, Im impacts to be used in mixed populations and biparental populations. But again, this should be looked at on a case by case basis. So that was uh, the summary of um, our of my presentation. So please um, let us know if you have any questions or you want to find out information about our nine our, our nine SSR fingerprint set or our cast fingerprint set and we would be happy to answer those questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy. Yeah. Okay, so our last presenter, who is also from the uh, USDA National Clonal Germplasm Repository, is Gabrielle Flores. Gabrielle, you ready? Yes, I am. I'm going to start sharing my screen. And can you see my screen? Not yet. There it is. There it is. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Gabriel Flores. I am a newly hired research technician at the NCGR Corvallis Gene Bank. Uh, my colleague Ryan King and our research leader, Dr. Kim Hummer, have put this poster together in order to describe the efforts uh, at the National Clonal Germplasm Repository to describe the conservation of hop plant genetic resources. Uh, as you all may know, the hop Commercial production is significant with a annual farm gate value for Oregon, $71 million and a billion dollars globally. Uh, currently, we are seeing a demand for our germplasm increasing. Uh, this is largely due to microbrewers. Microbrewers are seeking unique smelling hops to create new flavors, um, which is causing independent breeders and brewers 
to develop specialty hops to fit these unique niches. Uh, the NCGR preserves diverse plant and seed collection of about 600 hops uh, from over 21 countries. And this is in order to support those uh, breeders and researchers. Our hop collection uh, consists of wild native North American species plus land races and cultivar species. Uh, the gene bank is looking to obtain more germplasm through plant exploration and plant exchange, and that's uh, hop germplasm. So moving down to uh, the results here, uh, we keep our hop production in screenhouses. I mean, I'm sorry, our hop collection in screenhouses. Um, and these screenhouses do a great job of excluding aphids, which you all know uh, can be vectors for viruses and viroids. Um, in addition to that, we also take measures to prevent powdery mildew uh, by burning sulfur in the atmosphere of the greenhouses. Uh, another large mission here at the NCGR is to distribute. And whenever we get a hop germplasm request, we send rhizomes and leaf cuttings. And that is mostly to uh, uh, breeders and researchers, both nationally and internationally. Our plant collection is organized using labels. Uh, they the labels provide a plethora of information that help us maintain and manage our collection. Um, but recently, Ryan King has been working on adding these QR codes that you see in the corner uh, to our labels, and that's helping our staff take efficient inventory and uh, data collection. So beyond the plants, we also have a seed collection of hops here at the NCGR. And whenever we go out to collect these seeds and bring them back into Oregon, they are required to be cleaned and surface sterilized. So here you can see that uh, the shaft and, and debris is being blown away from all the seeds. When, then they are being service sterilized using a bleach solution um, where they are then put out to air dry. Once they're nice and clean, they're put away for storage until someone uh, requests their distribution. So we have also initiated a micropropagation and pathogen testing program here for our hop collection um, in order to help rid our collection of viruses and viroids. We're taking one millimeter of Mary stems and growing them up in tissue culture. Uh, we are then going to be testing them using ELISA and PCR. Uh, our ELISA is used for viruses, to test for viruses, and the PCR is used to test for the viroids. Uh, so in conclusion, the uh, NCGR Corvallis Gene Bank preserves about 600 diverse plants and seed accessions of hop species, cultivars, land races, and selections. Uh, pathogen testing and micropropagation procedures are being initiated in order to clean our collection of viruses and viroids. <clears throat> and new labeling, including QR codes, is being implemented for more efficient inventory management. Uh, you can find out more information about our hop collection or request it um, at Grin Global database, or you can go to our ARS website. Uh, thank you.